In this lecture, we will discuss, discuss multi-temporal data and its applications. So, in this lecture, we will discuss multi-temporal UAS data and we will also show some simple applications. So, why are we interested in the uh, multi-temporal data when we are talking about unmanned aerial systems? So, uh, and as you know, one of the reasons is the low cost and easy deployment, so they are ideally suited for monitoring. And uh, uh, we will discuss how to, what are the important aspects of setting up monitoring using UAS, how can we process UAS data uh, time series, uh, then we will show different examples and simple tools for analyzing data time series. Uh, then uh, I have provided some links to dynamic visualization, uh, which you have already done, but it even better applies on time series of uh, uh, UAS acquired data. And then we will show within uh, our assignment application in crop for crop monitoring and viewshed analysis over time. So why are we interested in UAS for monitoring landscape changes? And there are many different applications, so you can start thinking about them. As you are probably aware, and we already mentioned very uh, quite often, uh, one of the major areas of development is crop monitoring. Monitoring crop growth, disease, stress, uh, really bringing uh, uh, a low-cost intervention uh, to the mm, uh, in agriculture. Another important uh, application of uh, uh, monitoring is uh, erosion processes, especially on the coast. So there are many examples of uh, using UAS to monitor changes on the coast, especially coastal erosion but uh, it can be also used for stream bank erosion and uh, due to its very high resolution to monitor reels and gullies. Actually, one of the first applications uh, or first research publications of UAS was from monitoring gully evolution. Another application that is now being really used in practice is uh, uh, application of UAS uh, uh, during natural disasters rapidly evolving or slowly moving. So flooding would be uh, flooding or fire would be rapidly evolving uh, 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 disaster. But then there are landslides where uh, UAS is set up for long term monitoring to uh, for early warning. Mining and construction sites are another kinds of landscapes that often change where UAS is now being used, uh, you routinely used, and I'm sure that you can think about your own applications. So when we are designing uh, uh, monitoring, what are the, the issues or um, uh, problems that we need to think about? So first of all, you need to uh, define what are you going, what are the quantified variables that you are being, uh, that you want to monitor. So it is, you are not collecting just the images or deriving just the digital elevation models. Uh, you need to define what will you be deriving from this data. So it can be, for example, relative height if you are monitoring crop growth, it can be volume, for example, in mining, or it can be certain feature migration, such as uh, shoreline. Once you understand or define what are you going to monitor, then, uh, then you need to define the spatial resolution that is required to capture the changes. And, uh, then based on the spatial resolution, you will be defining or designing the altitude and taking into account the resolution of your, uh, of your camera. So spatial resolution is critical for acquiring useful data 
but also for not oversampling uh, and essentially increasing the cost of your processing. Another important consideration is temporal resolution. And that, of course, depends on how fast the phenomenon that you are monitoring evolves. So in mining and construction sites, uh, you know what the plan, the changes are, uh, but then you have, and similarly in crop monitoring, uh, you may have uh, uh, other considerations. Uh, for example, in natural uh, disasters, you need to very quickly adjust and your monitoring may be more event-based rather than based on some regular intervals. Another issue uh, is accessibility and overall rules and regulations. You don't want to design monitoring that would be breaking or would be in conflict in some rules and res uh, uh, regulations. And it may even, uh, uh, you may, these considerations may even affect, for example, your temporal resolution that you can use or the spatial resolution, how high you can fly. And of course, as we have mentioned many times over the past analysis of our data, very important is GRF referencing and rectification uh, for which you need to have a good GCP distribution and uh, uh, unless you have RTK GPS on your, uh, on your platform. So uh, taking into account how you are going to ensure uh, accuracy and minimize uh, uh, your distortion is also important. So once you have collected your data over time, what are we going to do with them? Uh, we have already discussed analysis of your point clouds and interpolation creating digital elevation models. When you are doing it for the time series, you need to ensure that the DSMs that you are designing are properly aligned so that the grids are not shifted and that they have common resolution. Of course, you can always go back and, and uh, reinterpolate, but this is something to keep in mind. And when, you are, when we are talking about the alignment of, uh, of regular grid, uh, you can imagine that the raster DSMs are much easier to align than uh, uh, triangular irregular networks, which are dependent on the point cloud, on the spatial distribution of point cloud, which changes with each survey. So you will see that most of the time series are really handled in raster digital representation rather than meshes, unless you can establish certain mesh, but then you will have to uh, compute your surfaces in the same, uh, to interpolate it to the same mesh. Uh, then we, as we have mentioned before, we use ground control points and permanent features to make sure that all our, uh, that, uh, all our surveys are accurate enough and uh, we can also correct errors and distortions if necessary. And then once we have properly aligned the uh, uh, digital surface models and imagery, and we have all uh, any possible uh, shifts or systematic errors corrected, then we can assign timestamps to our, uh, our data and register them within the GIS-based temporal data network. So when we are talking about temporal data network, what it, uh, what it is? It is an important framework which supports processing of large space-time data sets. And because UIS can generate very quickly, very large data sets, because you can go and measure often, uh, it is important to have this framework. Uh, when you, you can always just use regular series of raster files, uh, but you would have to write a lot of scripting to perform analysis. Temporal data framework makes it much easier. And it essentially supports work, uh, management and analysis of space-time data sets. So what are space-time data sets? 
it's a set of maps. It can be raster maps, it can be also vector maps, maps which are registered in a temporal database. And this registration in the temporal database allows us to perform various types of processing, analysis, queries, and things like that. Uh, and this space-time data set usually represents a dynamic process or some changing phenomenon where the individual maps represent the states of this dynamic process or of this dynamic system at a given time. And I have included in the, in the slides a link to the paper about temporal GIS for field-based environmental modeling. And I encourage you to read it because it explain, explains very nicely all the terminology, terminology with the, uh, about the temporal data sets and also these different kinds of operations that you generally need to do when working with time series. So one of the basics and fundamental concepts uh, for time series uh, working with temporal data is timestamp. And uh, uh, it sounds really easy, we just put there the date and time, but it can get uh, pretty complicated uh, because there are two basic types of timestamps. One is time instant, that means it is a snapshot at a given time and we will be working mostly with time instant it's an absolute time and it has a pretty standard formatting. But you can also have time interval associated with your raster maps. Uh, and the time interval is of course defined by start and end time. So for example, you can have monthly temperature data or monthly precipitation data or annual precipitation data. So this type of uh, data uh, with time interval timestamps is pretty common as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, with UAS surveys, we will be mostly working with snapshots and that means that we will have time instant timestamps. And on the bottom, you can see uh, the small subset of our time series that we will be using in the assignment. Once you re register your time series, then there are different tools that allow you to actually analyze how are your data distributed in space and time. Then another thing that you can derive is the temporal plot. Uh, you can click on any, po any point in your, uh, in your data and retrieve the evolution of the value, measured values along that, uh, in that time series at that point. Another very important functionality is temporal count and intersection. So once you have, especially with UAV data, uh, we always try to plan the, uh, the survey in such a way so that it consistently covers our area. But you may have situations when, uh, when the, your area over time may change because the, the, uh, the landscape has changed uh, or uh, you realize that you don't need to map as much as you thought at the very beginning. So there are different reasons why your, uh, your mapped area can change. So once you have, especially once you have a very large time series, then you really want to have an easy tool that will show you what is being covered. And one of those tools is to show count. Here the yellow area is covered by seven uh, maps in the time series. The green area is covered by five maps in the time, time series. Uh, so you can quickly see the extent, of your, uh, the extent of your mapping. And then you can extract the area that is fully covered by the entire time series and in our case, it is a relatively small subset. So uh, we intentionally uh, uh, selected this kind of uh, uh, survey so that you can easily see the differences between the, between the surveyed area. Uh, and uh, then uh, often it happens that we, let's say, repeat the flight. We can repeat the flight 
within one day or two days or we can repeat the flight uh, several times during one month but we are really interested only in monthly changes so then we can apply temporal aggregation and uh, for example for monthly we can define a function that will aggregate for example average all surveys within one month and here is an example of such ag aggregation so we have two flights during September and we just aggregate these two flights and uh, uh, create an average monthly average uh, of that map and when you look at these two images you can then think about whether for this particular case it would be a good idea or not and then in the next section of, of this lecture, we will talk about basic time series analysis.